for some historical context on this President's Day weekend. We're joined now by Douglas Brinkley. He's a presidential historian and the author of many books, including The Unfinished Presidency. And we're joined by Amy Parnes, a national political reporter. Her latest book, co-authored with John Allen Lucky, chronicles President Biden's 2020 campaign. It's so great to have both of you here. I love reflecting on the presidency, President's Day weekend. And Doug, we'll begin with you. You are close with former President Jimmy Carter. You've written a wonderful book about his unfinished presidency after he left the White House. He's now down in Plains, and it's a year ago today former President Carter entered hospice care, and a year later, he is still with us. Tell us about what you know uh, in, from, from the Carter family, how he's doing. I know it's a tough year. And what his presidency means. Well, you know, he, it is tough when you're 99, but Carter has a lot of will. Uh, and he's alert and eating and has an ability to understand what's going on around him. And I'm hoping he makes it till October 1st, 2024, so we have Jimmy Carter at 100 years old and we can celebrate. Um, he's kind of beat cancer before, but he's he's focused on eradication of guinea worm disease that used to uh, ravage you know over 20 African countries, and he he knows they're very close to doing away with that horrible disease, and he's been the progenitor of that effort, and he still has a cognizant about uh, about that. As for who he is, he's looking better and better every day in history because you pull back and look at that one, one, one term and you're seeing the Camp David Peace Accord, he's Egypt and Israel. Uh, look at what we have now. Uh, environmental Front, he put as much land as the state of Alaska, uh, uh, of California aside um, in Alaska. And that's only going to grow when climate happens, all that he saved. He injected human rights into our di diplomatic parlance. He's the person who uh, recognized the People's Republic of China, not Nixon officially. Um, and the Panama Canal Treaty, the list goes on and on. He created FEMA, Department of Energy, Superfund sites. So on paper, you look at all of this and you're saying, it's a remarkable one-term president who, by the way, is going out with the love of the world, a Nobel Peace Prize, and, it, and his integrity intact. And Amy, as Faulkner said, the past has really never passed. You think about President Joe Biden, who you've covered so closely. He endorsed Jimmy Carter in yeah. 1976 when Carter ran for president. He's been to Plains to visit with the former president and the late First Lady, Rosalind Carter. And there was something about Carter always feeling misunderstood by official Washington and Biden, a longtime insider in Washington, but you still sense from the Biden people these days a sense that he is misunderstood. Yes, and definitely. And when Doug was talking about one term, I think that that is a line that is scaring a lot of people inside Biden world right now and scaring a lot of Democrats because they think that he could possibly go down that Carter path and he could be a one term president. And that is what is driving the campaign right now and driving the White House to prevent him from becoming that. Um, um, and you're seeing that there there is this worry when you talk to people and they're being candid with you and they tell you what's really going on. There is a worry. They see what's happening in the polls. Biden himself is becoming frustrated with what is happening. And you see what's you see that they're trying. They're looking at the polls and saying, OK, what can we do better? How can we communicate our strategy more effectively? Because I think they know when they're being candid with you that they have failed. And when you look at the Biden campaign, it's not only President Joe Biden, it's Vice President Kamala Harris. What's her role in the coming year as this campaign heats up? Well, first off, it, it really looks like it's going to be Biden Harris, and you're reading all these people thinking Biden's going to drop out, and I, I don't believe it for a minute. Certainly not until, say, June. I mean, Joe Biden's going to collect all the delegates and own the Democratic Party, uh, and hopefully he'll go on with Kamala Harris. That's their plan. Now, if Biden had to drop out for some reason, I would say poll numbers hitting 22 uh, percent, uh, then they'd have to probably turn to Kamala Harris unless they were going to do something at the convention, like with the Michelle Obama, uh, Ma Admiral McRaven ticket as some sort of a well, uh, that, vast that, surprise, but that's it, pie it, in the sky. It, it's it's yeah. very pie in the sky, but I've noticed, Doug, that Jill Biden, the first lady, has been out front uh, working with the president, uh, urging supporters to rally behind him. Do you believe she's a vital part of this campaign? She is the vital part. Dr. Jill Biden is it. You know, if you go back to 1952, Harry Truman could have run, and he didn't. Why? 
well, the Korean War and, you know, other re but but Bess wanted to go back to independence. The, the, you know, he, he didn't like it in Washington. If he cut to 68, uh, Lyndon Johnson was quit in March of 68, and people say because of Walter Cronkite. No, the big thing was his health was bad. He had a bad heart. He was smoking, high blood pressure, tension, and Lady Bird Johnson didn't want to stay in it. He wanted let's go back to Texas, and convinced Johnson to step down. So in the Truman, I'm giving you two, Truman could have stayed on, and Johnson, and they both said, no, it's because their wives, their spouse said enough. That's not the case with Jill Biden. She likes power. She wants to stay. She wants some sense of revenge. She teaches in Virginia Community College. This milieu around our building here, this is, is her home. Um, and the idea of relinquishing it all uh, after you've taken the slings and arrows of the last uh, years of attacks. And at the last minute, just when you get all the delegates, you're going to say, I'm going to open it up to a bunch of people. It's, it's very childish when you read those kind of reports. Yeah. I see no reporting that that's going to happen. No, I don't think he would ever, ever, ever. I mean, he, th he feels that he is the most capable person of beating Trump. He said it publicly. He said it privately to former President Barack Obama. He said it to countless people. He thinks that he's the only one in the game who can do this. And he points to 2020 and even dating back to 2016. You know, he actually had beef with Hillary Clinton for a while because he thought, you know, if he would have run instead, he could have beaten uh, Donald Trump. And so, and here we are, you know, in this, he thinks, in this whole mess. So, but his problem is right now that he's going to have to counter all these polls that say that, you know, people don't have confidence in him anymore. When you see polls from 2020, he was supposed to be the guy who united the country, who was there to bring everyone together, who um, was this, you know, he talked about the soul of the nation. And a lot of people look around, they look at their bank accounts and they say, look, I'm still not feeling, I'm not feeling feeling great about things. I, I think that the country has become more divisive. And I think that he might pay the price for that. I hear from my sources close to President Biden that he's so frustrated behind the scenes because he'll point to economic data, even if people feel inflationary pain. They feel he knows they may they might be unhappy with the economy, but he points to the stock market and other data factors and says things are going well, things are getting better. And he's frustrated about the media all the time, talking about his age. How is that frustration playing out behind the scenes? It is. He's very frustrated, according to people I'm talking to, and all those reports are true. He is, he's increasingly saying, we have done so much. Look how much we have accomplished. Why isn't this out there more? And that's what I was talking about earlier when you talk about a communication strategy. He is having a communications problem, and that is what they're going to have to figure out quickly. Doug, you've written extensively about former President Ronald Reagan. Listening to Senator Lindsey Graham, you hear the tension now in the GOP when it comes to foreign policy. Is this Reagan's party at all anymore? Is it all now in the imprint of Trump, especially when it comes to issues like Putin, Russia, foreign affairs, Ukraine? It's, it's um, Trump's foreign policy. Uh, the days of Reagan are over. Reagan has more in common with Bill Clinton's presidency or Barack Obama's. Uh, Ronald Reagan always despised Russia and the Soviet Union because he saw it as totalitarian. He bet on that as a governor in the 1960s, given ardent speeches, democracy will prevail. Famously, he went and gave his boys a point to hawk speech at Normandy, Peggy Noonan's speech, among others over there, and said, we liberated the first half in World War II of Europe, and now we got to liberate the second half. So the breakup of the Soviet Union uh, that happened under uh, Bush 41 in 1991, that, that's the kind of thing Ronald Reagan loved. And Reagan would be ill, and particularly his ex former great Secretary of State George Shultz, to see this militarization in space that Russia is trying to do to you know, come up with new satellites that are nuclear things. Um, the, Reagan and Schultz wanted to start reducing nuclear weapons in the world, not increase them. Foreign policy also an issue for President Biden. I remember we'd be up on Capitol Hill in recent decades covering him when he was chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Now he's been focused on Ukraine, focused on the Middle East. You heard from Congressman Clyburn. I asked about the protests at some of these Democratic events, about the Biden administration's support for Israel in its war with Gaza. How does the Biden White House and your Biden sources think about 
foreign policy, but especially what's going on in Israel as they try to galvanize their own coalition? That's the big problem right now and the big question. They're trying to walk this tightrope, if you will, because they have to appease the base. The base is not happy. They know they're not happy. And you see him slowly walking back. You know, he was very, very deferential to Israel in, in the early days of the war. Um, now you're seeing it less and less. But I think you're, he's going to have to explain and talk to the people more about what is happening. I still don't think, though, Bob, that this will come down to foreign policy, that this election is about foreign policy. It's not too 2004. I think that um, it, it will come down to the economy and maybe immigration and abortion um, as two kind of subsequent issues. But I think the economy is what is really, really, really going to drive this election in voters. And apathy, you know, if, if they are feeling like no one understands them, if they're feeling like they can't relate to either side, there is the fear that they could stay home or they could vote for a third party. And that should be also what's worrying Democrats right now. And quickly, Amy, they're keeping an eye on Robert F. Kennedy Jr. and Cornell West and their independent candidacies at the White House? <laughs> they are. It's very real because they look at what happened in 2016, how Jill Stein kind of wrecked this for Hillary Clinton. She was one of the reasons, obviously. They are worried, and they should be worried, because, because people are so... I think indifference is a huge storyline in this election. The players are, re are two people we know. They're baked in. People know about them. The polls say what they're going to say. I don't know if it's going to change that much. And Doug, finally, I was on the streets of New York this week, not walking around. I was <laughs> covering former President Trump and his legal challenges in Manhattan. Step back as a historian to have Trump facing a hush money criminal trial starting in March, paying potentially hundreds of millions of dollars in a civil fraud case, two looming federal trials on the horizon, also Georgia. We've never seen anything like this. I know unprecedented mm. seems like we use that word all the time, but really, we have not seen it. We have not. It makes, you know, Spiro Agnew's little bribery thing look quaint in retrospect, <laughs> you know. Uh, Nixon's guys, Haldeman and Ehrlichman and Dean going doing a little jail time uh, over a, a, a bungled third-rate uh, burglary look quaint. This is somebody, who, uh, Donald Trump, who's been a predatory capitalist, getting money from wherever he can and making up products, uh, elevating his own self-worth. So what does it remind one of? Another American tradition, gangsters and, and cons, uh, in the sense that we elevate them. I mean, you go to Chicago, you don't hear the stories of the, the great politicians of that era, you hear about Al Capone and, you know, and Dillinger in the West, Billy the Kid and the like. So he's kind of an outlaw president and an ex-president and our country's a lot in the country like that. And Trump, of course, denies any wrongdoing in all of those cases. Douglas Brinkley, Amy Parnes, we really appreciate it.